Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I was hoping to write down a whole plan, uh, and to be honest, I haven't really filled in these two parts. So I'm just gonna. So today we'll focus. So then there's a three-part sort of uh, proposal for for lectures. Uh, the first part is today's contextuality. Okay, so I will try to give you uh, an overview of, of what uh, uh, contextuality is uh, all about. Uh, the usual question specter, the traditional notion, and, and a generalized notion, which is what I mostly work on, and uh, the connection between the two. So, the goal is to kind of that you should be able to appreciate how we go from this traditional framework to the generalized framework and 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 see in what sense this is an operationalization of, of this one. Okay, so that's I, I, I just hope to convince you that um, that this is an interesting operational way to think about the question spectrum here. Okay, uh, in the second lecture, I will um, uh, give you uh, some sort of an intro or people don't know uh, on uh, generalized probabilistic theories, and I will try to define the framework, like you know, the basic notions we might need. Um, and for the purposes of understanding the naturality, so not like in full generality, but just what we might need. Okay, and we will see. I mean, there might be stuff here that we'll have to spill into this one, and like you know, so we, we will see how that goes. Um, but, but the second one, I mostly aim to focus on the framework of GPTs and the relevant notions we might need to then talk about uh, contextuality in the language of GPTs and. Um, uh, uh, and then see if you can kind of reinterpret everything we learned here uh, purely in terms of GPTs. Okay, so there's three steps. This is the this is the usual framework. Uh, this is what most people have worked on. GPTs is a separate like independent development over the last twenty years. We've sort of developed very uh, nice frameworks for talking about uh, these probabilistic theories, more potentially more general than quantum theory. And uh, more recently, we've been thinking about how to uh, phrase in the language of GPTs. Okay. Okay. So for the first lecture, uh, so today we are just going to talk about contextuality. And uh, so, in terms of uh, what contextuality is all about, it's about uh, this nebulous word called well, classicality. When I say it's nebulous, I basically mean that it's a placeholder for various kinds of notions, namely qualitatively what I mean by non classicality. So it doesn't have a technical meaning in, in, in the sense that I'm using it. The, the qualitative meaning is that it's features of quantum theory that separate it or set it apart whatever part from classical theories. Now note that in all of this the most available word is classical. Okay? Because different people may have different ways of thinking about what counts as classical. And um, uh, the viewpoint that I'm taking is essentially one where we take the probabilistic prediction of quantum theory seriously. And so we're, we're going to try to be operational, and our statements are going to be about probabilistic phenomena, uh, about facts about uh, the operational probability you see in an experiment. Okay? So that's the sort of uh, type of uh, classicality I'm looking for. Like, what does it mean to say that some operational statistics you saw? It's classical by the lines of some well-defined notion of classicality. We have to give the definition. In the absence of a definition, it's a vacuous notion. Okay? So whenever someone says classical, you have to ask them what does it mean. And uh, and so of course, like you know, you can your notion of classicality could be uh, uh, local causality, uh, which is what Bell's theorem works with, works with, right? So if local causality fails, then that's called Bell normality. Or uh, you know, failure of local causality is Bell normality. So this is a failure of a notion of classicality, namely local causality. That's what Bell's theorem is. Uh, failure of separability, for example. 
So this is not entirely, this is within the structure of quantum theory, right? This is not directly about probabilities, this, this is about the structure of states. Um, failure of separability is entanglement, right? So this is another notion of, uh, so these are notions of classicality, right? And depending on what you care about, you may think of different notions of classicality. Um, failure of joint measurability. Classically, there seems to be no hurdle to inputs to measure things jointly. So failure of that is what we call measurement incompatibility, right? So by now the pattern should be clear, right? Like if I'm saying there's something called contextuality on this side, it's a notion of non-classicality. Um, then what's, what's this thing? What, what, what's failing here, right? Um, and I claim what's failing here is, uh, so Bell is about local causality, um, contextuality uh, is going to be about, so what fails is not contextuality, okay? That's what we call it contextuality. Again, this is not a priori very informative, but I hope to make it more precise. Um, and it also, again, this word, again, means different things uh, depending on at what point in history you ask this question. Okay? So, uh, we'll go way back. We'll go to the start. Uh, so this is just to give you a motivation for what intellectuality is. It's a notion of uh, non-classicality. And we want to sort of study how quantum theory manifests this notion. How, how, how does it show up? Okay, I mean, of course, like there's many other. This is not an exhaustive list, right? Like, you could think of um, uh, uh, quasi property representations, like positivity of a Wigner function, could be a potential notion of classicality. Right? If you see negativity, you're seeing something non classical. That's another notion. So, there's as many notions of uh, non classicality as there are people who care about these questions sometimes. Okay, um, and of course, they're all related, there, there are multiple relationships between them. And maybe if you're thinking about one, you don't think about the other, you don't see connections because you have to kind of function and think about the others. So my hope also is that by doing this uh, introduction, I'm able to kind of, uh, 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 you know, get you interested in contextuality and think about how it relates to what your favorite notions of uh, Martin Pascalvi are. Okay. So I think it would be nice to sort of understand the, the, the logical relationships between these things. Okay. So the neutrality uh, the, the story at least the focus of this talk starts with something called the Fortune Spector theorem. This is from the year 1967. And uh Fortune Fortune were the two uh, co-authors of this paper who uh, were both mostly in quantum logic and uh, so they were basically mathematicians, quantum logic people uh, and, uh, and yeah, and they came up with this sort of uh, an impossibility result for uh, invariable models of, of quantum theory okay? and that's what the quantum spectrum theorem is the, re the, the genesis of this work actually goes all the way back to uh, 1960 which was actually pretty bad uh, it's in a paper by Spectre uh, so in this paper by Strecker, uh, he's already kind of getting the essence of the quotient spectral theorem. And I think that all this paper was published late, uh, uh, there's some things in the literature that this result already existed in 1960. Okay. So, so Spectre wrote a paper, uh, it's originally in German, so I believe some of you here should be able to read the original version. I can't read the original version, so there is a version of this on the archive. Uh, I forgot the reference, but it's called... Um, on the logic of uh, simultaneously decidable propositions, or non simultaneously decidable propositions, and uh, something like that. Okay, so there is a translation. Uh, maybe you can read the original and then read the translation and, and let me know if it's a faithful translation because I'm only read the translation. Level, right? It's uh, on the archive, it's by uh, the book called MPC. Uh, I forget the reference right now, but I can, I can look it up and uh, let you know later. But, but that's why this person. 
So in this paper, a specter is already raising, raising the kind of kind of questions that are eventually kind of settled by the question of factor theorem. Okay. And uh, what, what what are the questions he's raising? The the question he's essentially raising is um, uh, like he always had theolo theological motivations for this question, which was is it does an omniscient God know the outcomes of all quantum measurements before the measurement is done? Right, that's the that's roughly the kind of question he was interested in. Okay, like uh, and, and that's the sense in which like you know some propositions will be simultaneously decidable like, in the sense that they're like you know their truth is jointly determined before you learn it. Right. So okay. So now let me give you uh, the technical statement for the question specter, and then we try to interpret it. Okay. So. Uh, so I'm saying it in the most general form possible, which includes, in particular, so, so question which better gave one way of proving this general statement, that you can prove it in many different ways. So I'm going to write down the general statement now. So the, give, the general statement is that given a separable Hilbert space um, H of dimension at least three. So you're working with Hilbert space since of dimension at least three. Um, that it does not exist. So it's a non-existent claim, non-existence claim. That it doesn't exist a map C. So C is a map uh, from. So okay, let's just take to be rank one projectors on on the Hilbert space. Okay, so I just mean the rank one projections by this. Or you can take them to be rays, like you know, just, just the rays along the hyper vector. Um, to uh, zero on uh, assignments, zero or one, uh, such that, so there's some condition on this map, such that um, for any complete orthogonal basis, for any complete measurement, for the same complete measurement. Complete measurement, I mean it's a resolution of the identity, so I set up to one. Okay, depending on the dimension of the input space, you know, that mean it's a complete measurement. I mean, maybe I can just write a final one, which is slightly. So these are usually orthogonal and uh, they add up to the identity, so that's a complete machine in that sense. Um, we have um, C Because when you go to dimension two, you have the same problem with Gleason theorem, but mm -hmm. uh, you can always find this kind of basis that yes. allow you to. Do yeah, these these maps always exist for in two dimensions. Yes. Right. Because there are no constraints; everything is free in two dimensions. I mean, you will see when I come to the proof, you will see that that's, that's what's happening. Uh, nice. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the general statement. It's about the non-existence of this map C, which has to satisfy this property that for every measurement. Complete measurement, maximum rendering, it assigns a probability one to exactly one outcome, and all the others are impossible. Okay, so it, it makes a possibility impossible to claim about what happens and what doesn't happen. Right? Um, okay, so um, 
what 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 are we how are we interpret this, right? Like, uh, so this is the technical statement about the non-existence of a certain map. Um, one way to think of this statement is that um, it's in principle it's impossible to imagine that outcomes of quantum measurements were determined before you actually did, did the measurement. It's even in, in principle impossible. Like you, you can't construct such a map. Like so when I say impossible, I mean such a map is impossible. Okay. And uh, and colloquially in the literature, you will see some people call this 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 thing. The the lesson they take from this is the slogan. I think Chris Fuchs likes this a lot, which is unperformed measurements have no outcomes. Now, this might seem obvious or trivial if you're kind of just saying, well, obviously they don't have outcomes because quantum theory is probabilistic, but this is a stronger statement than that, okay? It's a stronger statement because it's stating something about the non-existence of this map, okay? Not just a, 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 a you know, just a fluff, yeah, it's not just fluff, okay? It's, a, it's rooted in this, this, uh, this theorem, okay? And actually, Pritis has a nice article on this, actually, where he, where he um, talks about Bell's theorem, you can think of Bell's theorem in, in a similar way that uh, he called it, um, I think, I forget the title of his paper, but it had a similar kind of title and it's it's a paper in uh, it's Perry's American Journal of Physics uh, It's very pedagogical, so I guess that's why it's in AJP and uh, 46745 So in some sense, like you know, if, if you look at this paper, you also get some, some nice intuition for what's going on. So what, what does this mean? Like, I mean, if they did have uh, outcomes, if front form measurements did have outcomes before you actually learned those outcomes, then that would have meant that such a map C should, C should exist. And the fact that it doesn't exist means that front form measurements have no outcomes. Okay. So in that sense, uh, outcomes of quantum measurements cannot be predetermined prior to the act of measurement. This just follows from the structure of quantum uh, projectors. Okay. Okay, now how do we prove this? Uh, so slightly I guess. Uh, or maybe I'll just very here to uh, keep the plan. Okay, so I will give you a version of the proof. So it's not the the Cushion specular version, but it has the same quantitative character. So, quite the Cushion specular result, the dimension of the little space, so they were working with the Fugrid, so it was a minimum possible dimension, dimension 3, and uh, they used uh, some set of uh, uh, rays, some set of projectors, and the number of projectors they used was 117. Okay, so they used 117 directions in, in a three dimensional. In which space, they, it, it's all real vectors, so you can just think of a three dimensional real space. Okay, so 117 vectors, and they so show that you cannot color those vectors according to this map. Okay, they show that's what they show. But we're not going to look at that proof, elegant as it is. Uh, we're going to look at like the simplest known proof, and I think recently it's been proved that this is the smallest proof with the smallest number of vectors, like you can't reduce the vectors more than this, which is uh, in dimension four. It's not the minimum possible dimension, it's, it's a dimension higher, it's four dimensions. Um, and um, uh, the number of vectors it needs is 18. Okay. And I think uh, I believe there are some recent results in the literature which show that you cannot go below 18. Like uh, an argument that, that you cannot make, construct a smaller set of vectors which cannot be colored like this. If to prove the impossibility of this map C, you need to go to at least 18 vectors or more. Okay. In in three dimensions, the, the lowest numbers that are known are something like thirty one or so. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's a smaller proof than that. Okay. So so the version I'm giving you is from this paper by Cabello and uh, Esteban uh, Garcia King thing. Cabello at all, and this is from 1996. Um, and the upper reference for this is. 570 6009 on the edge in the olden days, days. So, yeah. And uh, 
Yeah, and, 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 and this construction really, uh, this is a historical remark, but this really uh, comes from a separate construction which is due to Barrett, um, and I think which is 1990 or something, I'm not sure, 1990 something like that, but he had this construction of uh, with n equals 24 and dimension h equals 4. And these 18 are basically 20, uh, 18 vectors picked out of this 24. So basically, 18 is enough, you don't need to go to 24. That's what these guys realized. They did some computational searches to figure out what the smallest uh, uh, thing was out of this 24 vector thing. And so 18 was the smallest they found. Uh, so, in that sense, like really, like the actual construction is due to various, and, and these guys found that there's a subset which works. Okay? Okay, so let's look at that subset. So, now I'm going to represent. Um, the orthogonality relations between the outcomes using hypergraphs. Okay, so a hypergraph is a essentially a generalization of a graph where your edges can have more than two vertices, right? Like more than two things can be connected by an edge, right? So what do I mean by that? This is a four vertex edge, right? Like uh, there are four vertices that are in, uh, so it's called a hyper edge for that reason. Okay, it's more than two vertices. Uh, so this is an example of a uh, hyper edge, and I'm trying to represent a measurement via these hyper edges. A measurement is this set of four outcomes. Okay, in four dimensions there will be four outcomes, uh, four or uh, in a complete measurement. Okay. Okay. Now I'm gonna. Uh, so if I draw a second one, I'm making some claim about these two measurements. There are two measurements now. First one, second one. The first one is four outcomes, the second one is four outcomes. But they seem to agree on this outcome, which is that the, the projector associated with this is the same in this one as in this one. Okay? So an example of that uh, uh, is for example, I don't know, like if you just represent them by 0, 1, 2, 3 on a four dimensional space, and uh, this is one measurement. I mean, it's not necessarily the measurements that will give you the proof. I'm just giving an example of what this thing is representing. Well, I think the first measurement. I mean, you can choose the arbitrary to be this for me. But like, uh, they have to be uniquely connected. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, if you take these three things on the plus or minus on this first subspace, right? Like the zero, one subspace. And let's say you don't do anything to the other. Right. So in this case, they actually share two outcomes. Like this outcome is uh, shared with this measurement, and this outcome is also shared with this measurement. Right. In this case, they only share one outcome. So you get the idea. Right. Like that's what I'm trying to represent here. We're not going to need the explicit form of the vectors. All you need to know is that such a thing exists, and you can look at the vectors in this paper if you're just interested in what the actual vectors are. Uh, I'm writing down. Uh, so when I Put things in a hyper edge, they are mutually orthogonal, so their uh, overlaps are zero with each other, right? So it's a complete measurement. And uh, this is a third measurement, okay? And then uh, uh, fourth measurement, which is this. Fifth measurement, which is this. A sixth measurement, which looks like this. Okay, so you can see that things are beginning to look interesting. There are some interlocking going on, and that put constraints on that map C because C is supposed to assign ones and zeros, and you are putting some constraints on that map uh, by drawing more hyper edges. So six measurements. This is the seventh one. Okay, so these two and these two, they form an orthogonal basis, and so that's another one. Uh, this is a seven, uh, six, seven, this is eighth measurement. Measurement number eight is this one. Okay, and I can get one more measurement out of these, which is, which is what I'm going to need to have a contradiction, which is this one. Okay, so it's a very symmetric figure. If you stare at it long enough, you will be able to draw it yourself. I've said it very long as you can see. Um, 
So the proof of the non-existence of that map goes through first coming up with a set of 18 vectors which have these orthogonal relations, common stems. Okay, so these are 18 vectors, like 4, like you come up with 18, carved up into 9 measurements. And um, yeah, and 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 uh, is it clear to everyone when I say that this represents all the current relations? Like you can, you know which vector is orthogonal to which one at least, like just to know this, right? Uh, like the ones we need for the contradiction theorem. And um, so now, if such a map existed, I should be I should be able to say which outcome occurred for a given measurement and which one didn't, right? So first, let's just try to um, do that. Uh, actually, I'll label these things. Okay, so maybe it'll be easier, useful later to have this these labels. V six, V seven. So these are just the labels for the vertices. Okay, there's some projector associated with them, but we can just think of abstract labels for now. V nine, V ten, V eleven, V twelve, V thirteen, V fourteen, fifteen. 16, 17, 18. Yeah? Okay, so if I say that that map exists, that implies a set of equations, right? It says that C of V1, V2, V3, V4 equals 1. That's the first equation. The second equation is C of V4 plus V5 plus V6 plus uh, V7 is equal, is equal to 1 and so on. There will be like 9 equations corresponding to the 9 measurements, right? So the last one, this is a 8th measurement, is C V6 plus V8 plus uh, V15 plus V17. This thing is equal to 1. Okay, so it's a system of equations, 9 equations, and you're looking for a solution uh, where these variables, these 18 variables, 0 value, um, you, because C is a map uh, to 0, 1, right? So CVI belongs to 0, 1 for all i, right? So that's, that's, that's the constraint. And to say that the map doesn't exist is to say that this solution doesn't exist. Okay. And how do you see that? The way you see that, that, that there's no solution to this, no consistent assignable values, is to note that every vertex here in this configuration appears in two hyperedges. It's shared between two measurements. Okay? That translates to the fact that each term here appears in two equations out of these nine. Yeah? Is that clear? Like the, the, the claim that since every vertex is appears in two hyperedges, every term here appears in two equations. Right? And since every term appears in two equations, if I add up the left hand side of these uh, equations, I should get two times the sum of whatever over i c v i. Right? That's the left hand side if I just add them up. And for that to exist a solution, this must equal 9 because there are 9 equations. Right? But remember, by assumption, we wanted uh, solutions which are 0 1 value. And there's no way that you, you're going to get an odd number by multiplying an integer by 2. Right? So, so there exists no solution, and this cannot be satisfied. Right? The, this is just a simple implication of this given set of equations, and this cannot be true for this map, so therefore the map doesn't exist, right? So the claim was that the map is defined for all possible projections, right? Here we just picked a small finite set and we showed that for this finite set, there's already, it's not possible to assign values, so we don't even need to look at the full set of projections. Just looking at this finite set, we can prove that it's impossible to assign such valuations, right? So, so that's the interesting content in the Gorton Spectre theorem, the fact that you can show the impossibility of this map using a finite set of vectors. Okay? It's good? Yeah? <coughs> so the, the choice of vectors, I suppose there is a very specific way of choosing them. Mm -hmm. um, 
So oh, people write programs to look for these things very often. That isn't the, like a uh, geometrical interpretation because each set of four vectors will define uh, orthonormal basis, mm -hmm. and then you have relation between the well the orientation of each of these uh, ortho yeah. orthonormal basis. So isn't the geometric interpretation for doing these kind of proofs? Yes, there is uh, for some kind of proofs. So for example, for this one, there is. But if you go to this twenty-four vector thing, like the so if you look at Perez's paper, he gives a nice geometric intuition for. How he constructs these vectors. He constructs them analytically, essentially, I think. Like, I'm not even sure he's running any programs. Like, so, in some sense, he's looking at some sort of a hypercube or something to, to sort yeah. of construct this. And these are just 18 of those points on, on, on that thing. So, um, I'm not an expert on the geometric intuition behind it, but, um, um, but yeah, it's possible to construct these things analytically if you have a nice intuition for high dimensional geometry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, so this is a, uh, and, and, and this, when I say n equals 24, this, this also serves as the basis of the more famous proof of the technology of Paris So, yeah. Mohamed basically post processed these 24 vectors into, you know, rows and columns of two qubit measurements and obtained other proofs. So, really, the, the source of everything is this one, and then these others are kind of derived from it in some sense. Um, so that's just a side remark about the connection with Paris moment. Um, ah yeah, if you want to see this connection more explicitly, then uh, you can check out my recent production, 21.9.135.4. Um, so in this paper, uh, there's a nice appendix where we connect different Formulations of the Cauchy spectrum, whether you're thinking these terms or thinking in terms of observables, and um, like you know how 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 to see the connections between different ways we could present it. But I'll stick to this presentation for this for this talk. Okay, so that was one way to prove this thing, and I call this the logical proof. Logical proof because it relies on a logical computation. I don't need to look at like some statistics or something. Just the pure orthogonal relations, the logical relationships between the measurements are enough to exclude the existence of this map C. Okay. Now, uh, can I raise this to that? Okay. Uh, the second category of proofs that you can use to again show the impossibility of that map is more involved in this, but more involved in the number of uh, uh, conceptual steps, not so much in terms of the vectors. Um, and the second type of proof is called the statistical. Well, we call it a statistical proof because it requires you to collect some statistics to, to claim that the map doesn't exist. Okay? And this is due to triage code and three other authors. Let me go back to CBS, but I've forgotten all the names. So if you see the various KCBS together, that's this proof, uh, 2008. Uh, is when it was published, but I think it was in the archive much earlier. So it's the archive of 706.0016. I think this was the first proof of its kind of like the portion spectrum, which was not the same as that. So it's not Bell, it's, 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 it's for a single system, it's not like for two systems. So for example, you could say that the, oh, I can think of this as a two qubit system, of measurements in a two qubit system, right? But you don't have to, it could be just a single four level system. Right, the, the composite nature of it doesn't really play a role here. Even and here, basically, the proof is going to be in dimension the lowest possible dimension, x equals three. So there's no way that you can think of it as a composite system. Okay, at least naively, the usual way of composite systems. Okay. And uh, but what it gives up is the logical character, right? Here. Like you move to three dimensions and reduce the number of vectors. The number of vectors you need is like ten. Uh, but actually, you just need five, but uh, the other five are just normalization ones, they just hang around. Um, and so maybe I'll just say five. Because even, even there, when I say 117, that's excluding the ones that you add to make the few measurements. So uh, if you include those, then it's 190 or something. So, so I'll just say five here for consistency to put the thing there. And, uh, Again, I draw a hypergraph just like I do there. And so now there will be five three outcome measurements on a three dimensional paper space. This is the first measurement. 
This is the second one. This is the third one. Um, the fourth one. Okay, so this is a pretty simple type of graph. You obviously know that there is no, I mean, there will always exist solutions for equations of this form here. Okay, the easy way to say it is just put ones and zeros, so zero, 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 I can put a one here, put a zero, one here, and zero, or actually I can put more ones on the edges, so one, zero, zero. So here's a possible assignment that could exist uh, because, so just writing this down doesn't rule out the existence of the C map, okay? The C already, like, this alone doesn't rule it out, so we need to do something with it to show that C has not exist, right? And what we need to do is uh, we need to take states into account. Okay. So here we, I never referred to what state these measurements were being done on. Like I just said these are measurements, they have some logical relationships and done. Like that, that excludes the, the possibility of the map C. Here I have some measurements. The possibility of the map C is not excluded by them alone, by the logical relationships alone. So I need to bring states into picture, right? So because I bring states into picture, so let's say there's some special state side on which these measurements will be made. Okay. So special state. Okay. On which these measurements will be done. Okay. And um, and so this will produce some probabilities for these measurements, right? Um, and let me see how the best, how the best way to say this is. Right. So. Um, Let's say, um, so if I was looking, okay, let me do this thing. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. And I have all these middle ones which I've never shared with anything. W1, W2, W3, W4, W5. Okay? And the thing we're going to be interested in, so I'm going to erase this. So, what? So, I'm trying to do all this. Um, so these are just labels for these uh, vectors or rays. And uh, the map C will be something that should satisfy these properties, right? C1 plus V1 um, and so on uh, until the last one. <coughs> And we know that this already exists. I already showed you that, that, that such map exists. So there's no contradiction yet. Uh, but if these are quantum measurements and these measurements are done on a quantum state, then quantum theory prescribes uh, a rule for auto assigned probabilities to these measurements, right? So if, for example, let's call this some projector L1L1, this is L2L2. So in quantum theory, these measurements. Or of course, one of these projectors, let's say. Up or down for. I'm kind of using the rotation box in, in these projectors. Uh, oh, sorry, L3, L3, L4, L4, L3, L4, 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 and then this one is L5, L5. Yeah, so there are these things. So now the probability that you assign to V1, the quantum, that quantum theory would assign. Is some p of um, so p of v i so this is assigned by quantum theory okay um, is equal to the overlap square of the corresponding vector right like if I'm measuring on state side right so it depends on the, it depends on what state I, I, I measure things on right these probabilities depend on that so they're state dependent another word for these groups are state dependent groups the previous one was state independent. Right? So, okay. So, so this is given to you. And now the, uh, the, the question is, can I understand this set of five probabilities? So, I'm only looking at the ones where there is a non-trivial sharing between different measurements because those are the ones that are of interest for these kinds of groups. And so, I can ask if this set of probabilities, V3, 
3, 4, e 5. Think of like the last minute, just a vector or something. If I can think of it as some probabilistic mixture over different possible maps C, in principle, there could be many different ways of assigning values to these, right? Uh, according to different kinds of map C. So, for example, uh, just so just to recall what I was doing earlier, uh, one way to assign was like the thing I was trying to do, uh, 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 and one. But I can assign it differently, right? But uh, if I assign, uh, I don't know, a one here, uh, then I have to have a zero and zero here, I have a zero and zero here, and uh, uh, let me put a one here. So this is zero here, a zero here, zero here, uh, and a zero here and a one here. Yeah. So these are two possible assignments, right? Like there's the first set, which is just these guys, and then there's the outer set. Right. Those are two different maps. Right. So, so in general, there can be non-unique ways of assigning. At least, if you're just looking at this finite set of vectors, there are in general different possible maps which could assign the values. Right. So here we're trying to take into account all of those possible maps. Okay. And we're saying, does there exist a convex mixture? So this is the distribution of them over these maps C, where each of these maps is assigning values in zero one to these probabilities. Three, Five, right? Can I reproduce the observed probabilities as a convex mixture of the deterministic assignments that these maps C will make to my measurements? Right? That's the question I'm, I'm asking. Is it possible? Okay. And if I show that this is not possible, right? Um, then I prove that there doesn't exist. Any assignment C that will uh, that can underlie that you know there, there exists no family of deterministic assignments that could have reproduced my probabilistic observations. Okay, so you you rule it out in a very indirect way. You, you rule it out by going to the context all of all possible assignments, and then you're saying, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's again a geometrical interpretation question. Sorry if I'm knowing. But then, can we say this is like looking for the uh, dual polytope to the polytope you assign to the measurements? Um, so basically, assigning five such measurements will define some kind of a polytope in the space. Yeah. And then, looking at the the C assignments, you are kind of searching for dual polytope. So it's a, it's a, so the thing is that the general. So if you look at just the polytope that will correspond to these guys, mm -hmm. like okay, it's not about that. If I'm taking that in the quantum probability, then it's not a polytope. Okay. Because in general, if I just said that these probabilities, the only constraints on them are this P1 plus V1 plus PV2 is less than or equal to 1. Um, V2 plus V3 is less than or equal to 1, and so on. Yes. So V5 plus V1 is less than or equal to 1. Then defines a polytope. Yes. Yeah. Right? Uh, but that polytope contains probabilities that we cannot achieve quantumly. Right? So quantum okay. data, the quantum set of probabilities will be inside this polytope. Is this the most general set of probabilities you could have? And then quantum theory is within it. And this defines a polytope an even smaller polytope. Yes. Like this, this thing, this one, which is where there's a gap between them. Is this uh, inside the dual polytope of what you just defined? Uh, so what do you mean by dual polytope is what I'm trying to understand? Uh, uh, does the polytope you build by using the uh, middle of the faces? Uh, I, I, generalization. No, I didn't have that geometric sort of intuition for the dual polytope. I was just. I, I don't know if. Yeah, uh, I'm just asking if there is proof like that in the literature. Not that I'm aware of, but yeah. but, but also that's also probably just because I don't uh, think of. Um, uh, I, I think of these as just like linear uh, sort of uh, programs and like. Uh, so, like, I, I don't know if. Um, because the word dual means different things in different, like there's this polyhedral duality, there's other kinds of dualities. Yes. So, I'm, and I've even forgotten the definition of polyhedral duality, so uh, I'm not going to go into the, that part. But uh, but yeah, I, mean, I don't think I, maybe I don't have a good answer to your question in that sense. Uh, but that's okay. Just but basically, there's going to be three sets of correlations there's the most general set, there's the quantum set, and there's going to be this set. And the gap between these two is what proves the question's factor theorem. Okay? 
Uh, and what, what is that? Uh, how do you show that gap? You show that gap by looking at a certain function of these guys. Okay, so it's, a, it's, it's like a well portion spectral function. It's defined to be from i equals 1 to 5. Um, uh, probability from three okay. It's just as simple as that. It's just the sum of these five probabilities. Okay. Now, if you believe that this there exists, um, uh, th that you can deterministically, uh, that you can reproduce these probabilities uh, via such a convex mixture, then I think that this quantity should be upper bounded by the number two. Okay, that you cannot exceed the value two for the sum of probabilities, no matter what you do, if you are assigning things deterministically and then making a convex hull. Okay. And how do you see that? You see that because uh, basically uh, the the max you can achieve for this this thing under um, so I'll erase this a bit. Uh, so the max of uh, this thing uh, will, since since it's a complex situation, is is going to be for deterministic things, right? So I only wrote that way actually. So. So the, the these two maps here, the first map, it assigns one here, zero here, one here, zero here, and a zero here. So it assigns the, the maximum it achieves is two for the sum, right? The, the inner one, and this one. If I take the sum of the five, these five corners, that's just two. Okay? And the same is true, I think, for the outside as well, where if you take the sum over the corners, then it's also two. Okay. My claim is that you cannot color it. You cannot increase it to three, for example, right? And you cannot yeah. assign three. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So my claim is that you cannot assign ones and zeros to these guys in a way that the vertices, the values assigned to the vertices, add up to three. That's the claim. It has to be less than or equal to two. It's just a constraint that follows from the orthogonal relations of these things, right? Because if I assign a 1 here, I have to have zeros here, right? And if I have zeros here, the only place I can put a 1 elsewhere is here. If I put a 1 here, then I have to have a 0 here. And so, at most, I can only assign 2 vertices to value 1, right? So, any map C of that form is constrained by this, constrained by the structure of these measurements, right? Um, and so, that's the argument for why this upper bound, and no matter what complex mixtures you take of that, this, this function here, it, it's it's going to be optimized only at some sort of like you know at a deterministic assignment. Like it, it's not going to do better than the best deterministic assignment. So so two is the bound on this. If you, if you believe that such a map C exists, then this inequality should hold. Good. Okay. And uh, what 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 does the proof uh, of uh, uh, quotient spectra now do? What it does is to show that uh, uh, quantum theory. Uh, that this is strictly less than square root of 5, which you can achieve, achieve quantumly. Okay? So, what it does is it constructs some psi. This is the job of the proof. It constructs some psi and some uh, vectors on 5, such that this thing, you know, sum over psi to 1 to 5 of Li psi of 5 is uh, equal to square root of 5. And I think this is the maximum to be, you know, larger than that. Okay? Now, you, you might ask yourself, um, okay, it's, uh, it's square root of 5, probably you can do this much. Um, but if you were, if you allow these properties to be free, like if I didn't impose anything in the quantum, if I just require these constraints, then you can do better than this actually. Like you can go all the way to 5 over 2, which is 2.5. And I don't know how much square root of 5 is, but that can be less than 2.5. Um, and, and, and how do you achieve 2.5? 2.5 is basically this assignment. Right? But, uh, it's actually the unique uh, indeterministic assignments. Where I put half here at all of the corners and zeros everywhere else. Okay? That's the assignment. It's not a quantum assignment because you cannot achieve it with uh, projective magnitudes and quantum theory. Uh, but logically, you can go all the way up to 2.5. So these are called. This, so this, this is the kind of bond that you would say is for general probabilistic cases, where where you know, you don't put additional constraints on these guys. Okay. 
So that's so here's the hierarchy. There's the classical stuff. Uh, so the theorem, the quotient spiker theorem, is just about classical versus quantum. It's not about quantum versus GPUs. Okay. So oh, classical versus non-classical. But anyway, so there are three, these three bounds. There's the classical one which follows from the existence of the map C. There's the quantum one which follows from the existence of this inside which like and, and these measurements which will give you probabilities which achieve square root of five. And um, and there's the logical one in some sense, like the algebraic upper bound, which is given by just these constraints. Okay. And uh, so these are classical quantum GDP. Like you know, if you look at the literature, like people, that's how they characterize these three levels. Of correlations. Okay, so again, uh, it's not important what the details of these are. They're all, uh, for Tim, it's probably important the geometry of these things. But uh, Sorry. for my like, for the conceptual point I want to make, it's just that these things exist. You can look them up in this paper, uh, KCBS paper, and you can verify. And, and they have a nice geometry actually. To be honest, like yeah, they have this. It's this very uh, equal angles, like these these R L one to R five equal angles. The side is like uh, in the symmetric kind of uh, in the right in the middle. Like it's like uh, I don't know. It's, it's like it's like opening an umbrella or something like that. That's the kind of uh, intuition that people give for it, like the construction, uh, like a five point umbrella. Like, uh, like the handle is the is really the, the the state yes. of the umbrella. <laughs> so it's uh, so you, the overlaps have to be just right to so that you get that square root five. It's, it's it's pretty nice. I mean the fact that you're getting this nice square root five means that there's some Interesting geometry going on there, but um, but yeah, but that's just me being um, conspiracy theorist about numbers. Uh, um, but yeah, so 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 I will just say classical here. This is quantum, and this is GPT. And this this stuff, this observation here that we made. So we started with trying to rule out this this map C, right? And now people pe uh, people have uh, there are very defined combinations of contextuality now, quotient uh, spiker contextuality, but uh, this has been generalized to any graph rather than so here we looked at so so of the the measurement elements that were of interest were the five corners of this type graph. Right? So so if you just look at the automatic relation between the relevant uh, guys, uh, I just want to make a tangent and look over there. Yeah. So, so underlying this thing is basically this structure. This is the structure on which the inequalities are really defined, right? Like it's the vertices of this thing. And if you look at the inequalities, the, the first bound, the classical bound, this two, it's the independence number of the graph. Okay. What is the independence number? The independence number is the Maximum number of non adjacent vertices that exist in this graph. Okay, so it goes to the definition of an independent set. An independent set is, uh, or a stable set, or I forget the exact words, but it is one where uh, um, none of the vertices are connected to each other. Right? So if the vertices are B1, B2, B3, B4, B5, and uh, which are the unconnected vertices? Is B1 unconnected? B3, but then it's connected to uh, B2 and B5, but then B3 is connected to B4, so I can't actually include B4, so I can say B1 and B3 form an independent set. So, at, so the claim is that no matter what independent set you construct, you would not have more than two vertices in that, right? So, so it's a combinatorial property of the graph that there's this classical bound. Okay? So this is another observation, it, uh, and there's a whole framework built around this, which uh, generalizes to other graphs. So this is due to uh, Cabello, Severini, Winter, and this is, uh, I guess, the the short version of this is this Pierre version. Uh, the archive link for it is this one, and in this framework, they show that like the classical bound is given by something like this. The quantum bound is kind of an upper bound that. I I don't think they claim that it can always be saturated uh, because I think it's not always saturated. But it's given by this another graph invariant called the low arch theta uh, function. So low arch. So this has an. So the important thing is that these things have independent definitions in graph theory. Like they, although here we are motivated by quantum stuff, uh, 
Uh, graph pairs have been saying this low architecture function for a long time, or I don't know, for some amount of capacity or something that people are being like, people like. But, but it has independent motivations, and so it's a quantity that people thought about. And then uh, the GPT bound, uh, this is quantum, is uh, um, I'm being a little bit loose here. I'm saying GPT, but like uh, technically, it's like a set of theories which satisfy this principle of consistent exclusivity, which, which in general would be some sort of a subset of a GPT. But um, for if you look at the right family, for the family where this, this framework makes sense, then they're basically the same. For that, you need to read this long paper that I have. <laughs> but yeah, it's just a GPT is the wrong. Okay, and uh, so this thing is called the fractional packing number. Fractional, and the thing is that the definitions of these are very intuitive once you understand the simplest case, right? Like if you understand the simplest case, the definitions are just generalizations of that. So when I say the lower scalar number, it's basically a number you get by uh, computing this thing uh, when you sort of ask for a common representation of these vertices and uh, a handle. So the size for the handle in that literature. Uh, so, so this the, the expression for this is basically a maximization of this thing uh, under quantum representations. Basically, that's what it produces. That's why it's a value problem. And this fraction packing number is basically the most you can achieve under only these constraints, right? So that's two point five. So this is just a remark that that that, that everything I said here about the pentagon is goes through for higher, uh, more complicated graphs. Okay. So. Uh, one remark I want to make here is that, uh, um, yeah, that, that this uh, framework. So note that this kind of functional is kind of very much like a bell kind of functional. Okay, take some expectation value. So you can write it in terms of observables also if you want. Here I've just written it like this. But uh, even value you can write in terms of probabilities over events rather than observable expectations values of observables. But the point is that in bell you depend on the existence of a special state. Except that in Bell, the state has to be a, a, a very well prepared entangled state on which you can buy in Bell inequalities. And the, the, word, the measurements that you have in a Bell experiment also have some orthogonal relations. So you can write those down and look at the kind of problems you can achieve under some choice of state, and that defines a set of quantum probabilities you can achieve and stuff, right? So, so in some sense, this framework subsumes uh, Bell correlations also. It's not just what you it. It also includes Bell because. Uh, you can you can talk about composite systems yes, as well. Okay, so in that sense, uh, there's this uh, claim in the literature that Bell and Cauchy Specter are kind of uh, manifestations of the same thing, and uh, but strictly speaking, they are not because the Bell does admit a proof of the, lo the logic kind of proof that I first gave you. Right, you cannot prove Bell's theorem without uh, in a way that's independent of the state. Okay, because it, that's what it does. It starts certifying the time. Right. Uh, so, question specter, strictly speaking, is uh, uh, just just looking at these frameworks is, is, is mathematically is, is, is more general, more accommodating than, than Bell. Um, okay, so I just want to make a remark between statistical proofs of the question specter theorem and, and Bell's theorem that they are kind of qualitatively of the same spirit. In Bell's theorem, the, this max C is like the assignment that your local hidden variables make of the assignments they make to the local measurements you're doing. Okay. So the, the whole thing uh, you can motivate like that. Okay, so is that clear? Like, so we are here now. I can now move on to the interesting kind of contextuality, which is more operational. Uh, before, like, I mean, this is interesting, of course, but now if you want to do experiments, I will come to why it's not interesting for experiments. How much time? Is it? How much time? Do you want to finish earlier today, myself? Okay. Yeah. It, it was planned that we finish earlier. Okay, uh, what time do we finish? Uh, 12.30 is okay, I guess. Uh, I, can, I can finish earlier, so... Yeah, yeah, we we can finish earlier. So when do you have to go again? 15 past 12. 15 past 12? Okay. okay. If, you, if you don't ask me questions, I might be able to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> I missed, I missed the, the point of the proof rack thing. Ah, uh, sorry. You, yeah. you computed all of these bounds. Like, mm. how does Cochrane Spectre then follow? Ah, uh, Cochrane Spectre followed from. Oh, shit, I deleted the stuff. But, like, the, 
It follows because the existence of this map C is what gave us this bound uh, from here, right? This, this two that I was writing here. It followed from the existence of this. Right. Right. And so, but if I just see that these correlations are stronger than what the existence of this map implies, then I've ruled out the existence of this map. Right. right. So you so you say there exists a situation where this theta, uh, this lower edge theta, is larger. Yeah. Uh, than two and that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Everything is strict. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So that fact uh, implies that this thing cannot exist. Yeah, so you, well, just to be completely sure, you're, so you're observing that the bounds can be saturated and therefore mm -hmm. it follows, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm back. I was just trying to say that the same one follows from the existence of these things, and since this is violated, this thing cannot exist. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, should we wait for what yeah. uh, Is he coming back or did he abandon? No idea. <laughs> okay, I'll just uh, write a few things. Oh, yeah, doing okay. Okay. Yeah. 
because you want this effect, this effect to add to identity, this plus this to identity, this plus this to identity. The only solution to that is that they're all uh, identity over two. So this is just this effect. Yeah? So they all have to be equal to each other, right? So E1 equals E3, E2 equals E3, and E1 equals E2. Yeah? So which means that, and they have to add up to identity, so they're all half. Yeah? There's only one solution here. And so if you, if you, if you extend your quotient spectrum to POVMs, and you said that this is an interesting kind of map to think about, then I use the completely true POVM to rule out this map. Right? Am I doing something non classical here? I mean, I'm not, I'm just flipping coins, right? And to flip coins and say that you prove the quotient spectrum theorem doesn't sound like a good notion of uh, non classicality. So, this is this kind of giving you an intuition for why, what's wrong with POVMs. <coughs> okay, so what's wrong here is that these, these uh, effects are completely trivial, right? Like they're still technically quantum effects, but they're trivial because no matter what preparation I throw at them, whatever preparation I do, I mean, do a complicated entanglement, say whatever. Whatever I might measure on these things on, I will always get point flip outcomes. It doesn't matter what I prepare. It's completely underconformative. It doesn't tell me anything about what's going on with my system. Right? Yet, if I align the extent of the to POVM, I will get this kind of trivial contradictions with these completely noisy measurements. Okay? So that's the fundamental issue with trying to do quotient spectra with POVM. So anyone who tells you that there's a nice way to talk about quotient spectra for POVMs, this is a simple counterexample for why it's not interesting to talk. To take this seriously as a notion of non classical. So when you go to generalize the probabilistic theories, which are like even more general mm -hmm. than POVMs, then why is it interesting in that case and not the um, it still No, I'm, I'm still looking at some notion of sharp measurements in those general theories. Oh, okay. Because the, the only kind of general theories that actually make sense, so even if, if you read the, the, the CSW framework, like the later papers of them, they always add the qualification that we're looking at sharp measurements in these theories. Because uh, because we did already criticize them in print, like we said that okay, if you're talking about sharp match, I mean this example doesn't exist in the literature. I just came up with it. What about pure gamma to a rank one? Because in um, sense, uh, as in you restricted to that all the effects have at least one eigenvalue, eigenvalue one, eigenvalue, one, eigenvalue one. Because mm. they, they will still have like, this. It's it's conceptually possible. So basically, the same as the projection case, in that case. Maybe. Maybe. The thing is, the, what I'm trying to say is that conceptually it's possible to, I mean, if you appropriately restrict your POVMs to avoid some, like I gave you this example, you plug this yeah. hole, you say, I exclude these kinds of things by stipulating that, uh, you know, there must be a rank one effect or something in my POVM. Yeah. And you stick to that family and you say, okay, the, the, this thing is well defined now for this set. But I just give you the simplest one I could think of. It's conceivable that I can come up with another example for that one, which shows why that's not interesting. My point is that, the, the, the problem with this is that you'll always be plugging holes if you don't give a principal reason why you care about this set of POVMs and not some other. So, well, if I, think you to, yeah. I mean, so to this example, it isn't very convincing to me at least because, okay, you say, well, this example, you use a trivial uh -huh. uh, POVM, yeah. a trivial effect. Yeah. Of course, no one cares about trivial effects. Yeah. You should show that we're non trivial effects. Mm -hmm. Why yeah, so, so so this this has been uh, so this is in this paper by uh, so actually I gave you the simplest version mm -hmm. version of this argument that I could give you. But uh, this is uh, in this um, so there's a lot long paper by Rob actually discussing exactly this thing. So it's called the stages of determinism. Um, so in proofs of uh, uh, whatever uh, contextual RP. It's a long title. But it starts with the word status of determinism and it's from 2014. And in this paper, um, um, uh, the, so, so he explicitly discusses some examples of, of question spectrum with POVMs that exist in the literature. So Cabello has a PRL on this, mm -hmm. on, on defining POVMs, uh, which, uh, and of course they're not trivial, they're not working with trivial because uh, he wouldn't get into PRL otherwise. Right? So he looks at this qubit POVM, which you cannot color in the right way, and, and therefore it's kind of interesting, uh, is the claim. And so that's no non trivial example than what I'm giving you. So you could say that this is a straw man, but, uh, but that's like, that's something in the so presumably it's not a straw man. So you can, you can look up a, a detailed criticism of that in this paper. But, but basically what this paper talks about is this assumption of um, outcome determinism for unsharp measurements, so ODEM. 
Okay, so if you read this paper, it's written in like a dialectical style, like it's written like you know, the, the interjector and the, like someone re responding to it, and like so it's written up very very much like a play. Uh, and so there's like two characters here, the proponents of um, of outcome determinism for Armstrong measurements. So when I say outcome determinism for Armstrong measurements, it's the fact that you believe that your ontological model should assign ones and zeros. Like that, 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 that the C, this map C, the fact that it takes values in 0 and 1, that's the assumption of outcome determinism. Mm -hmm. And when I change our measurement, it means that you extend the domain to include all, all effects. Okay? Yeah. Uh, so, so, this is from the perspective of this generalized contextuality we have talked about. So, because within that, you define these notions. So, within generalized non contextuality, this, this, this assumption is untenable. It's, it's not, you, you should not be doing this because if you do this, um, you will have all kinds of nonsense going on. I actually I cannot fully understand. Yes. Uh, the okay, this is interesting, but actually I feel that like I do not fully understand your argument. First, I do not understand all this triviality shows here. Uh, it, it may, does it not also imply that maybe okay, maybe Cartman should be trivial altogether? Like mm -hmm. why? Uh, I don't know. It's about something that the is point, about that. The, po the point I'm trying to make is the the you propose the notion of non Pascal. Okay. First thing is you propose the notion of non classicality, it's this quotient factor. Okay? It applies to projective measurements, uh, ask for a sign. So it's very particular. Yeah? That's the starting point. Of projective measurements. Why? Yeah. Let, let, me, let me just. Uh, I want to go beyond projective yeah. measurements, yeah. but I'm, what I'm, I'm trying to say that this is a bad way to generalize project uh, to POVMs. Yeah. I'm going to go to a good way to do it. But um, right now I'm just trying to argue that a naive extension of this definition to effects here on this side. Is uninteresting for the reason that these completely trivial measurements look very non classical by that definition of, by this proposed extended definition of classicality. But it would mean two things. It would mean that also here what you are observing is nothing non classical. It, it might also mean that. And you know, the projective case? Yeah, I mean, what, like, what, well, why is this non classical? Uh, maybe, maybe it's just some feature or hidden. No, but when you say why is this uh, non classical, can you give me a completely trivial example of the question spectral theorem with projective measurements? That's what I'm trying to say, right? Like, because, like, I mean, pure quantum theory is as non classical as you can get <laughs> away from. Um, uh, so, like, when you're just talking about projectors, like, uh, it's, 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 you, you, you do not have a resolution of that into some mixture of. But uh, there are assumptions. There are assumptions. There, right? Mm -hmm. You assume that these specific vectors will be. You get a unique value and so on. So, so you, you are making it's assumptions. A, yeah, assumptions so it's a, from a, some yeah. domain. And yes. That's the important point is the definition of the domain. Yes. yes. And here you say this one is. Like, we, today we talk about PVMs. When the quantum mechanical theorem was proved, people did not think about PVMs so much in the. Uh, okay, except for some quantum logic people, like people didn't. It wasn't part of the mainstream to talk about POVMs and and, and, and stuff. So obviously, the, the the original motivation for this came from just the projection lattice, and in, so the motivation for this is really in quantum logic because people look at the lattice of projections and can you define a sensible notion of logic for it? And this kind of also puts constraints on that. Mm -hmm. So so it has historical baggage. That's where it's coming from. But now people try to kind of forget about that. And try to say, oh, we'll be operational and we will kind of extend this to POVMs or something, and it doesn't work. Is all kind of thing. Maybe I don't know, like, uh, so again, with the form logics, you can have more than like 0, 1, like classical. Sure. You could have a sure. so spectrum of propositions. the essence of the reason why it doesn't work? I don't get it from this example, but I would introduce maybe this shows it, but I don't know. So, I was, I was, so the first thing I was saying was if I just look at this hypergraph, it doesn't exist a map of the form C. Okay? Yes. Even if it admitted a PPM realization. Okay? Let's say it admits a projective realization. Even then, it doesn't admit a map of the form C. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? But secondly, actually, it doesn't even admit a PPM realization. Right? So, so it's actually like there's no domain even to consider here because the, these guys, they, they cannot be projectors. Right? So these two things are not possible. Now, the third thing is, Okay, what if I extend? Uh, so it doesn't emit a PPM realization. So let's extend the definition of this C to include POVMs, like so to include effects, arbitrary effects here. So that's called C effect here. And uh, and does it exist a POVM realization? Does it exist a realization with some quantum effects? And uh, yeah, I mean you, you can write down these effects. It's the only way you can you can construct things that look like POVMs. 
which realizes this kind of scenario, this situation. And uh, uh, but you cannot color them. Like you, you like that extended map is not definable on, on, on this on this set of uh, noisy methods, right? And if you take that as your as saying that you've seen some contextuality or some non-classical things, then that runs into contradiction with one's intuitions about what these methods are because they're just flips. I didn't need to care about the system to do these methods. So they're not revealing some non-trivial property of my system that I'm measuring. No, they're not because they're I I, I didn't I didn't need to care about the system. Right. So, it's so it's the tension between the triviality. Right. I can see two things. One is that this graph is not a good, maybe a good graph to test on. Not the classicality by this because it's also a classical feature. This non colorability of this specific graph, but does it imply that it could, does it imply that with pure VMs I can't do anything more interesting on it? It's just maybe because this one graph is not a good Okay, so okay. So start with an arbitrary graph. Start with an arbitrary graph. This is an arbitrary graph. I can achieve this. If I attach this constraint from lower theta to arbitrary effects, mm -hmm. I allow lower theta to be defined over arbitrary effects basically, it won't be lower theta anymore, but whatever. If I allow the PVM, I can achieve all the way here. This is basically quantum under the PVM. There's no uh, nothing uh, non classical here, and in fact, even this is uh, the same as quantum under the PVM. Like, uh, like the, in not alpha G, but like, this hierarchy will collapse is what I'm trying to say. Okay? If you extend the POVMs, you will have that R is less than or equal to alpha star G for all, like for classical quantum and GPT. And that's the thing. The thing is that, that this is what is happening. Here, what is alpha star G? Alpha star G for this graph is 3 by 2. How do I achieve it? I can achieve it completely classically in some sense because, uh, um, or actually, let me say quantum and classical collapses because if I, I let me stick to the definition of classical because that's the point, right? And we want to stick to this uh, assignment kind of definition. So, actually, what I want to say is when hierarchy collapses, uh, yeah, so, so the fact that, uh, yeah, so, so for any, any graph, no matter which graph you give me, if I look at the set of probabilities that the generalized probabilistic uh, polytope gives me, I just have to assign an identity to that thing. No? This is a trivial POVM realization of the same probabilities that are very non classical. Is what I'm trying to say. Like, does it, does it make any sense? I, I think I understand the whole thing. So, I'm, I'm, this is just my intuition. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if that paper addresses it. Mm -hmm. But again, I think you could probably restrict yourself to. Like non one theory ends. So then you it does it, 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 it does it does address that, but not from this angle. Like mm -hmm. it, it's more from the spine spring angle. Mm -hmm. So so because um, um, if you say that outcome determinism is not a good assumption for the uh, measurement, but it's a good assumption for sharp measurement because mm -hmm. that's what what inspector does. Yeah. No, no, but uh, I think if you have uh, so, so, so this is basically my rough intuition, like this C, right? C taking a projection equals to one, right? If you take C as like trace with a state, right? Roughly mm -hmm. speaking, the reason it, this proof that techniques works for projective measurements is that you could assume there is a state which exists in the support of the projection, but then the projection test doesn't yeah. work, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if the POVM is non one, which I think is a generalization of like an observable that can have objective values, it's just mm -hmm. on sharp now, because each effect has an eigenvalue on eigenspace, mm -hmm. then roughly my intuition is that you wouldn't have a topology because again, all the time you so The thing is, uh, like, um, um, but, but my the, the, the question is, is the question is how stable is that notion under uh, introduction of noise to that POVM? Like, how much do you need to fine tune the kind of POVM to look at? What do you mean by noise? You just define like, POVM, which is just that. Yeah, know. yeah, but, but you, you need to give me a um, sort of. Um, uh, at what point do you say that uh, you, okay? So one one thing you could do is you could say okay, I just disallow all trivial PVMs and say I just just never allow this. You know that's the minimal constraint you could do. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not a it's, it's not it's not a I, I don't know how to say it like it's it's not the cleanest way to do it. Like uh, basically what you want what I'm trying to say is that your notion of non classicality should be such that in the presence of noise, mm -hmm. as you increase the noise in your measurements or states. 
it should become trivial. Like it should, like in a completely noisy situation, it should say things are classical. It shouldn't say things are still not classical. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. The, the desiderata here is that in a real life situation, if you're doing an experiment, you don't control all the measurements that you're doing. It could be maybe you're doing something really bad and it's completely noisy. Mm -hmm. And then if your figure of merit is something like motion spider, you might think that something non classical is going on, but it's not. Because it's a very noisy measurement and the, the problem is with the notion of classicality, it's not with the uh, so, yeah, okay. so I think yeah. it's, it's this continuity thing of like the, mm -hmm. the, the notion of non-classicality doesn't remain interesting mm -hmm. under arbitrarily noisy situations. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, you know? So maybe this is so, so my yeah. so one mistake would be that a good notion of non-classicality should be one that declares this to be a classical situation and doesn't kind of seem mm -hmm. to indicate that something non-classical is going on. Sure. Right? It, it should be it should not by fiat, not by hand, but it should be defined in in a principal way, in a manner. That this is a consequence of the definition, not it's not something put in by hand, we just trying to fix question factor. No. It should be something that follows from the assumptions of the framework. Not not it's not because you kind of saw this, oh I'll plug in a hole and we'll stick to the domain. No. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. And that's what this framework tries to do. Like it's it's although it's kind of motivated by these things, mm -hmm. the definitions originally were independent of these things. But the definitions were motivated well enough that it can handle these situations. Is what I'm going to eventually okay. kind of demonstrate, and I show there's a limit in which this framework reduces to everything I told you about quotient spectra, and that limit is the noiseless limit. That one, everything's projective, and, but in the noise limit, it will declare this is completely classical. It will not say that this is classical, mm -hmm. and that happens by a modification of these inequalities. We'll modify these inequalities later. Basically, there will be a term in this inequality which will quantify, in some sense, the quality of your measurement. Like, so these are these are really bad measurements. They don't give you any information about the state. So when I add that quantity, there will be a trade-off between this this correlation and that quantity. So like if the if the quality of the measurement goes down, it's very easy to achieve very high values for this thing. Like that's what's happening here, right? But if you have very high quality measurements, then you can only go up to a certain amount. Like you know, you, you won't achieve the general progress you want, right? Because you're doing something. So, so, information disturbance, uh, so you can think of it as a correlation. In, um, I think I like to think of it as some sort of um, um, yeah. So uh, as this this, this function, like this cor if you think of it as some sort of correlation between measurements, so measurement measurement correlation uh, versus um, uh, predictability trade off. So in such a sense, like the, the trade off between correlation between measurements and the quality of the individual measurements, mm -hmm. right? Because you can have very strongly correlated classical measurements. But they're classical measurements because they're kind of they like this is an example of strongly correlated uh, classical measurements, right? But what you want is strongly correlated things that are doing something non-trivial, something non-classical, right? So, so, so that term would show up in in, in the, the the extension of these frameworks within this general framework. So this general framework applies into situations that also go outside quotient spectra. It doesn't only apply to quotient spectra, but here I'm trying to motivate things. From the perspective of the quotient spectral theorem. You can also, I could have done this whole lecture starting with just this and axiomatically introduce this, but then you wouldn't see the connections between prior literature and why it was kind of interesting to define this notion. And, and so, so the definition of this will feel a little bit more justified if you already know that there are some issues with uh, meaningfully talking about uh, what the quotient spectral theorem was doing. So that's that's kind of roughly the that's the narrative strategy I'm adopting basically. The, the strategy is to introduce you to something that already exists in the literature, so that you at least know what people mean when they talk about these things. And then secondly, how that connects with uh, this other stuff. So I don't know how much time I have. Uh, I can do it next time. Okay. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. If you want to stop at fifteen, I, yes. I can. Uh, 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 Okay, so what I can do is, if I have 10 minutes, I can just introduce the definition of an ontological model and uh, what non contextuality is, and that's it. I will not go to how to fit questions back into this. Okay, so it, it, it should be not too hard to finish that part, and then I will try to get to the questions back generalization to the, in the next one. Um, okay. So, for generalized contextuality, we need to first um, talk about what an operational theory is. 
Again, it's a very bare bones uh, description of what I will mean by an operational theory. Um, so there's some measurement setting. So this box just does this measurement M. Uh, no, sorry, it should first prepare something, prepare something, send it out. Uh, this thing is received here in this uh, uh, measurement device. Maybe that's a small feature, I don't know. And then you register some classical object here. And the set of uh, uh, preparation procedures in your theory uh, can I'll just denote them by this uh, script P kind of thing and set of measurement procedures is uh, this M, this 30 M and set of outputs for a given measurement is some set like this. Okay, for our purpose, let's just take these things to be discrete. I mean, the, the conceptual point I want to make will not rely on the discreteness of the uh, uh, continuousness of this thing. But uh, so so uh, I'm going going to only look at prepare and measure kind of experiments. Okay, like no no transformations at the moment. Although the framework applies also to transformations, but um, uh, to make connections with questions better, it's best to restrict and also to study the simplest framework, um, simplest uh, examples. Uh, we will restrict to prepare and measure. Why did I erase that? Uh, ah, I just wanted to say that the. Title of the props paper was uh, contextuality for preparations, transformations, and unsharp measurements. So note that he says unsharp measurements because he thinks that for sharp measurements, the question structure is kind of good. Like, like it's 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 kind of like the unsharpness is a, a problem that needs to be handled. And this is like a 2005. Seconds is different from sometimes um, And so what does the operational theory give? It gives me just a list of probabilities for seeing some outcome given that the measurement M was done on preparation P. So just the set of probabilities for all K and P is the empirical quantum of my theory. Right? Like, so it's just some it's just like a, a very reductive not reduction, like a very uh, minimal account, minimal operation account of what the theory tells you. And uh, so an example of an operational theory is operational quantum theory. So quantum theory viewed in, through this perspective where these probabilities, there's a definite rule for how to compute these probabilities and that rule is the bond rule, right? Which again uh, implicitly means that there's a certain way you're going to represent your effects and a certain way in which you're going to represent your preparations. Right, so quantum theory stipulates that preparations for constant density operators and the effects of the k given m it corresponds to some effect, uh, some operator again, in some input space. So it maps these operational things to some objects in input space on uh, operators on input space, and then it provides a prescription for computing these probability. Right, that's what quantum theory does. A general probabilistic theory and some some other probabilistic theory could use a different prescription for assigning uh, probabilities. Okay, combining states and effects in some other way. So, um, so this is just 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 a bare bones. Like this is what we need to first have, and the second notion we need to be able to state these uh, this generalized uh, contextuality thing is uh, uh, the notion of an ontological model. Um, so. And note that implicitly I've been talking about some sort of ontological model throughout here. When I said that there exists this map C, it's kind of like this map C is not coming from quantum theory, it's, it's from your description of you. You're trying to say that oh, in, real, in reality there is some map C that assigns values, and effectively we just see some, uh, you know, everything you see is some noisy, some, like, you know, there might be some convex mixture of these values that produces the statistics I see, right? So ontological model formalizes that idea. Okay, like, uh, a bit more uh, rigorously, and so when I say an ontological model, uh, I will say of an operational theory. So we've given an operational theory, an operational description, and we want to give it give an ontological account of it. And uh, what does that mean? In an ontological account, your basic objects. So here the basic objects are these boxes, right? 
and how you combine these boxes to produce these probabilities. In this framework, uh, in this view, uh, you still have these boxes, but you make a certain claim about what these boxes are doing. So you make a claim that this box, uh, this P, when I do a preparation procedure, it samples, it prepares, uh, in a given manner, it prepares something called a complex state, which is supposed to be like the real physical state of the system. So lambda is some space, some sort of relevant space on which you can define the solution, basically. It needs to be at least that. And then uh, uh, this lambda it goes into some measurement device on which you again see some probe uh, some of k. And uh, and what's the connection between this and this? The connection is that um, so um, so an ontological model is claims that there exists these maps. So earlier remember there was just this map from projectors to zero one values. Now I'll talk about two maps. One is there exists a map mu p uh, from um, ontic states from these lambdas to uh, probabilities. Okay. Such that um, Sum over lambda mu p lambda equals one. So it's a it's some sort of probability measure over over lambda. And there is another map for the effect a given n from lambda to probabilities. Note again that uh, <coughs> these are allowed to be arbitrary probabilities. I'm not asking them to be zero one. If I ask them to be zero one, that's more like Russian spectrum. Okay. The notation looks different, but uh, you will see the connections uh, when I come to generalization of questions factor. And uh, here, so it's a response function. We call these things response functions. Uh, it's basically how your ontic state responds to a measurement. And this is a, uh, I guess, a preparation distribution or something, like how you prepare your ontic states. And uh, so, okay, and. And uh, so, so, so these are normalized uh, response functions, right? Like the, for a given lambda, if you measure it with uh, setting m, then the outcomes you observe, the probabilities for those should add, add up to one. That's the physical meaning of this map, right? Like it's just asking for, it's just a basic uh, um, uh, account of uh, what's going on. And then the claim is that these objects, these two maps, can be combined in a way. That reproduces the operation statistics. The operation statistics was given by this thing. And the claim is that I can obtain this as a coarse grain of what's really going on, what's really going on with this thing, which is that when I measure, uh, so firstly, when I prepare the pressure P, I sample lambda according to some probability. And this lambda, when it's received by the measurement M, produces some outcome K for the setting M. With this probability, which depends on lambda, so this is a response function, and so 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 these response functions get coarse grained according to the preparation distribution, right? And that that reproduces the operation statistics. So this is an uh, so this is just a basic description for what an ontological model is supposed to be, and um, non-contextuality. So now we have these two notions. So we can talk about non-contextuality. Um, this maybe. So, not, so, so far, I have not really put any constraints on the ontological model. Okay, so there is actually no hurdle to actually like this thing. These maps always exist. Okay, like if I say does there exist an ontological model of operational theory? The answer is yes. Okay. Why do we say these are maps from 1 to 0, 1? Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's a problem. Yeah. 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 And, and so, so this thing always exists. Okay, there's no word to the existence of this thing. A simple way to do this, for example, for quantum theory would be where you map all your pure states to uh, delta distributions. You know, over if you take pure states as your sample space, as your optic space, state space, and you map every preparation to a uh, the, the, to, to any mixed state will be a mixture of these things, so it will be some 
distribution of these things. And pure sets will be delta functions on this space. And uh, and you just take these uh, uh, response functions to be just given by the bond rule on those complex states. So that's a, that's a trivial way to construct a normal model. So, so these things always exist. So I've not put a constraint right now. Okay. So constraint is when uh, when you ask some property of this ontological model, that's when you start to impose some notion of classicality, right? So right now there's no notion of classic. The, maybe the only notion of classicality here is maybe just the fact that I'm using these classical probabilities and you know combining them in very naive ways to reproduce quantum predictions. But you have to say something more than that if you want to impose a notion of classicality. So I will impose a notion of classicality, which will be non-contextuality. And you can understand non-contextuality. No, no, no. Sure. Just flexing. <laughs> uh, is the operational identity. So in a slogan, that's what it is. Operational identity. Uh, sorry, ontological identity of operational indiscernibles. Okay. So when I say indiscernibles, I mean experimenting in distinguishable things. Okay? So, so this is an assumption on the ontological model. So far, here I didn't have to impose an assumption on the ontological model, now I'm going to impose an assumption. And the assumption is that things that are indiscernible at the operational period, like namely I can't, can't do an experiment to distinguish two procedures, then they must be identical to the ontological model. Namely the, the maps associated with those procedures, whether preparations or measurements, should be identical. Okay. So let me let me concretely write it down so that it becomes clear what uh, these words mean. Um, so in terms of operational indiscernibles, um, let's look at preparations. So I call two preparation procedures P1 and P2 operationally equivalent. So I will use this symbol to mean operational equivalence. If so, this means the definition of this is that probability of k given m p1 equals probability of k given m p2 for all possible measurement interventions you could have done in your uh, operational theory. Right? Uh, okay. There is no intervention you can do here that will distinguish P1 or P2. Right? So the, the theory doesn't distinguish these two things. Right? So they're indiscernible. So these are indiscernible. Um, and when I say ontological identity, that takes the form of preparation on contextuality. So, so this, I will call this preparation uh, non contextuality. Is the idea that if things are operationally indiscernible, they should be ontologically identical. Namely, the ontological representations of these P, P, P's should be the same. So, mu P1 should be equal to mu P2. Okay? It's an assumption, it's, an, it's a hypothesis about the ontological model. Okay? We, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's true only under this assumption, it's not, it's not a logical implication. Okay? So, this is, this is the side of ontological identity. Now, what does this mean concretely? In quantum theory, an example of this, P1 and P2, is uh, if P1 is, for example, you take this ensemble of half uh, 0, 0 and half 1, 1, right? You prepare a uh, maximum mixed qubit state by using the Z basis. P2, maybe you use a different basis, X basis. This is a different preparation procedure, but these two correspond to the same uh, mixed state, right? That is the same statistically equivalent. So there's no way I can tell which preparation ensemble was used by doing measurements on this overall preparation, right? So that's that's an indistinguishability at the operation level. And in non logical model, you will ask that the distribution of our ontic states associated with this is identical to the distribution of our ontic states associated with this one, right? Now recall, recall, 
that trivial model I was saying, where you know the preparations are associated with the delta functions over lambda. Then, um, um, then this distribution has no overlap with this distribution. These are actually distinct distributions. So that that model was trivially preparation contextual. Like it it, it, it it fails to satisfy this assumption, right? So so if I impose preparation on context only, it rules out models of that form. So we're beginning to rule out ontological models, right? Um, the second one is in exactly an identical way. You can talk about um, uh, measurements. So now your operational indiscernibles are the effects. So if this is operationally equivalent to this effect, or measurement event, let's say measurement event, if I use a very loaded word, um, then that is basically the definition of this is that. There is no intervention, maybe no preparation, uh, that will give you different outcomes for these two effects. Right? So, for all P. Okay? And uh, the ontological identity is that if these are uh, indistinguishable operationally, then ontologically the response functions, it's like K given M, K1, M1, M2 should be the same. That that your representation under this map is the same for the two things. Okay? And yeah, we always basically means that they have the same there's the same effect, just we exactly, 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 exactly. So this this is real, uh, so let me just go back to that example that I had. Um, right? We had things like this, right? Like this, and we had this. Okay? So these are let's say two measurement settings. This is setting one, this is setting two. So and I call these measurement outcomes. Uh, one for measurement setting one, two for setting one, three for setting one, and four for setting one. When I see this measurement, right? When I see this measurement, then I say one for setting two, two for setting two, three for setting two, and four for setting two, right? So I'm just officially labeling these things. And what am I saying? I'm saying that. So the fact that this this vertex is shared between the two hyperedges is is a statement of operational equivalence. It's saying that the effect associated with outcome one of measurement M two is indistinguishable from uh, like, um, the other given four given M one. In quantum theory, the way this is implemented is that the associated effects one given M two is the same as the four given M one. Right. So that's what. That's because the empirical content of the theory is only in the effects, it's not in the detailed measurement procedure. Right? And that's so uh, and, and so, so that's what you're asking. You're asking that if it corresponds to uh, in quantum period, it's the same effect. In, in this case it is because it's shared between two. Then the response function for these two instances instances of the measurement or different measurements should be identical. I shouldn't treat them differently. Okay? Because if I treat them differently, that's kind of contextuality. Uh, like you, you, you're choosing this response function depending on the context of the measurement, right? So this is measurement non-contextuality. This this I get here. And I will stop there. Basically, what's going to happen later is that we're going to show that how preparation non-contextuality and measurement non-contextuality imply. Uh, constraints, operational constraints on pro, on uh, correlations. Okay, so so these are assumptions we are making about the existence of these maps, and if these maps exist, that implies some constraints on the operational statistics that they are supposed to be produced. Okay, and that will give us give us some inequalities, and they will be generalizations of the in the portion spectral case, there will be generalizations of the uh, inequalities I was showing you, like for, for example. KCPS and stuff. And so that's where we will go like the next time. Like uh, hopefully I'll be able to uh, finish that part next time and then I can do a little bit of GPPs before uh, finishing that section. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Thanks. So, if you quantum states, play the role of Lambda and Yeah. So, so uh, that's a good question because that's, that's a good question that people often raise.
which is that if you take the lambda to be basically all density operators, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. So it will be this very expensive uh, sort of ontological model yeah. where every quantum state, mm -hmm. mix, every mixed state, is a yeah. vertex of some yeah. sort of simplex and then yeah. uh, distributions, right? Or something like that. And the problem with that is to do with convexity. Because uh, if I take another state that is a convex mixture of like row 1, row 2, and if I insist on a delta function for each of these, that can't be true, right? That the convexity doesn't really go through. You see? Like the mixture, a mixture of these two states is this state in quantum theory. Then I go to a representation where each of these states is a point, like a case space, like, uh, like a delta distribution, which is focused on that this point row 1. Another one will focus on the point row 2. Then the mixture of these two is not a delta function, right? It's not, it's, it's like there's a delta function associated with this one. Okay. So, so there's a problem with convexity, like convexity is what's going to go wrong. Pure state or something? Pure state is fine. Pure state, you will have uh, this convexity thing is fine because uh, mixed state are defined as convex mixtures of uh, pure states. And so convexity is fine. But what goes wrong is the preparation um, along the text. Okay, right? so, so in this example, I will have some, um, like, so let's say mu of 0, 0. Uh, lambda is some delta function on uh, lambda minus the ontic state that I associate with 0, 0. Right? So, so the, uh, the, the phase space is basically all pure states, is what we are looking at. So lambdas are associated with those things. And uh, the same thing is true for 1, 1. Okay. Say that again. Now, this is a, is this a separate idea about how you mix? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, I, 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 didn't, I didn't make this explicit here, but basically when you, so I, I said these maps, but actually these maps should also preserve complex. Uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah. so that's an auxiliary assumption that I didn't mention here. Yeah. But but yeah, I just for simplicity I wanted to focus on yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. You just focus on that. Yeah, yeah. It exists, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I just said that this is the only thing, then of course it exists. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it's it's not a very plausible model in any case because of this problem with mixing that yes. you, you can't meaningfully talk about mixing in those models. Mm -hmm. Why do you have why do you have a convexity structure on your ontological space? Um naively I would assume that that there's, that there's a very um, like complicated assumption, a very powerful assumption to assume uh, complexity that seems unwarranted at first blush. Yeah, it, it is important, I think maybe this one was designed, but, but basically the motivation is that if you think that there's, there's this, um, if you believe in this picture, right, like that, that, like there is this kind of lambda that's going here, and these are assigned, these are associated with some distributions and response functions, then the uh, um, the, the, there's something that's super painful in this experiment, right? Which is our assumptions about can I make probabilistic choices of which preparation to do, right? Like if I say if I do a half p1 plus half p2, I have to say what is how that is represented in my ontological model, right? Now you can say that okay, I don't put any constraints based on it. I, I don't say that uh, in my ontological model in, in one run. With probably half, I'm sampling according to procedure P1, uh, and with probably half, I'm sampling according to procedure P2, right? Like so, so, so that's a new procedure, which is a probabilistic mixture of these two. Now, if I say that that's not represented um, by a probabilistic mixture of the associated uh, distributions, these maps, these will be. Then uh, I don't know. Like I feel like the ontological model uh, loses kind of its sort of status as a description of, of um, I mean, I guess I'm using this auxiliary assumption that, that, that convexity is kind of a physically well-motivated thing that we can meaningfully talk about our ignorance between alternatives and, and so maybe you are kind of adding that in, uh, the convex structure, but I feel like if, the, if you come up with models without the convex structure, like you come up with like these maps that don't satisfy convexity, I don't know how interesting they're going to be. Like, for example, quotient spectra didn't seem to use convex structure, but actually, like, if you try to formulate it within this kind of generalized language, then you see that, yeah, I mean, if you actually seriously want an ontological model and not just rule out one, then uh, you kind of do need to meaningfully 
to be able. So basically, you need to be able to talk about uh, probabilistic mixtures of things because you can always think of a, uh, assigning probabilities as a, as, a, as a mental operation, right? Like it's kind of your own uncertainty about what happened. So you're just like uh, under that view. Or you can think of uh, coarse gradients, right? Like I can I can take two measurement events, combine the probabilities, declare them to be one event, right? Like so I can coarse grain probabilities. So again, this is not something that maybe my experiment is doing, but it's the post processing that I'm doing, right? So it's kind of like the, the theory has to be stable under these kinds of post processing, basically pre and post processing, right? And so um, so I think it's implicitly that sort of thing that comes in when you say complexity, like you're, you're kind of trying to ensure that that. that that I can meaningfully talk about these mental operations I might do in my head and it still gives me an answer that's within the theory. It doesn't give me something that's not uh, meaningful in the theory. Right? Like, I don't know. The, that's roughly the, the motivation for, for this. But there is a nice um, uh, paper on, uh, it's pretty technical uh, by uh, Rob and David and uh, John. It's called Causal Inferential Theories. So if you like categories and other stuff like that, maybe you would like this framework. Uh, um, so the authors of this paper are uh, Schmidt, Selby, uh, Selby, Schmidt, and Speckham. Uh, it's a recent paper, it's a pretty long paper. Um, I haven't read it myself, I plan to read it at some point. But basically, like these assumptions of convexity and course grading and stuff, they they separate them much more cleanly in this framework than I did in this ontological models framework because here I wasn't trying to separate uh, the causal aspects from the inferential aspects. So this this probability is of course thing. These are inferential things. These are things like you you can think of them as inferential acts. They're not uh, necessarily out there in the world. They could be, but they don't have to be. Um, on the other hand, this causal stuff is like when you prepare something, you send something, you measure it, you observe it. So it, there was something you did, you made some difference to the world to, to see these probabilities. So those probabilities are, are, are coming from your experiment, they're not just acts of mental jugglery. And so, so this framework kind of tries to separate these, uh, it, the goal is to kind of separate the epistemic and the ontological aspects of what's happening. Mm -hmm. By ontological, actually, ontological really just causal in this framework. But, um, Anyway, you should read this if you're interested in the, the, the background motivation for uh, because the ontological models framework is a bit kind of like uh, it's not equipped to talk about like the distinctions between these 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 concepts. This framework is equipped to talk about them, and I think that's where you'll find more rigorous answers for for everything I was saying. And it was kind of motivated by questions like these actually. Like the, the they ended up constructing something that's like an absolute. Uh, is this recorded? <laughs> <laughs> it's an absolute monster, but <laughs> but I still have to kind of get to sure, understand so it. Can you assume uh, yeah, at the ontological level since we said it's five times higher? Yeah, yeah, we assume that. Yeah, that's a background. I don't know if Kevin, I don't think it, I don't know if the Sharpen of course the thing addresses this because this is a very different this is already on a more fundamental level now to allow uh, so, so people construct these calls, things called retro causal ontological models, no, no. which will, um, uh -huh. uh, which uh, so I mean the guy I, I guess the one guy I know a lot of this but it was Ken Walton, and uh, I guess Hugh Price was a philosopher. So these two people are probably the ones that I've heard of to think about these kind of things. I know that Matthew Sane and Michael could also have a short paper on this on time symmetry actually if you're interested in that. And uh, so, so these models kind of relax the assumption that like you know that uh, few, uh, of, of uh, that future cannot affect the past. Like the future can affect the past, but it doesn't make an observable difference kind of thing. Like, so they use some hidden mm -hmm. signaling back in time to reproduce, like for example, bell correlations. Right? Like, so so there exist models of bell correlations where you can relax, you can allow for retro causality, and then uh, you know you can influence the hidden variables, therefore you can influence uh, you can reproduce correlations that you couldn't otherwise produce. Basically local causality fails in the causal models actually. You're going to have uh, uh, but at the same time I think the situation will look like not at the operation level will look more sibling and stuff. I mean I'm not an expert on these, but, but these things exist where people and use no, retro causality as a and way out. It's a way out, it gives a way out. You know? yeah. I think contextually also it should give you a way out. I, I don't know if people have to start out. And so I think Martin, so I can find a stronger. Uh, I think in Costa Shrapna. But it's still a small the same thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, so so fast flash wrapper uh, is basically what uh, they were motivated by. So this is a paper uh, uh, by Fabio Costa and Sally Shrapnel on. Uh, it's called causation doesn't explain conventionality, and they are they are basically uh, motivated by um, um, uh, they they are motivated by this kind of observations that, like for example, through Bell, if you allow for retrocausality, you can kind of explain it away. Okay? If, if there was some retrocausality happening. So they were interested if there is like even in the process matrix framework or in like uh, this causal indefinite framework, is there a notion of uh, contextuality that remains like even though retrocausal models can explain it away? Like but is there something that remains even though you have a causality? And they argue that something that does remain. And the argument so yeah, uh, kind of is of a similar spirit as you do in standard quantum theory. The mathematical structures it uses are the same, but the conceptual reading is that you can kind of uh, uh, that yeah, even with exotic causality, you can have some type of contextuality. You can't get rid of contextuality. Is, is what they say. Like in Bell, you use exotic causality to get rid of Bell quantum But in uh, uh, the claim is that there's a notion of contextuality which you cannot get rid of if you allow for exotic causality. This notion you can get rid of because we basically just have it. I suppose you can get rid of because we're kind of assuming that the preparation screens, uh, like the rocket state lambda screens off the preparation from the dimension, right? Mm -hmm. So when I when I write down this thing, all the effects of the preparation are mediated through lambda to the dimension, right? For example, that's the basic assumption here. If I if I actually I don't even have to uh, maybe even just abandon the screening assumption is enough to kind of Get away, get out of things, right? right? So, so yeah. So there's a lot of these auxiliary assumptions that I didn't mention here, which are, which are part of the framework. And uh, I think this is called lambda mediation or something. And um, and people play with these things, like people do computations and like you know, they, they try to see push different assumptions, change a few things, and see if you can reproduce non-classical things. If you, they, I mean, the goal is to identify these hidden assumptions that are kind of implicit in the framework. That which, for example, this convexity thing, like you know, which which people might say is um, uh, maybe someone might come up with a model which is, doesn't satisfy complexity, you know, right? That's But then what's the point? Like, I mean, if it's not a plausible model of the world, right? I mean, maybe it's a conceptual point, but it, the point is to show that it is an important assumption to make. But uh, it's not necessarily the point that it's plausible here in the world. So, yeah. Okay, so I'll stop. Thank you.